Okay, so, so we had seen quite a few concepts here, right? Uh, with regards to filters, we saw low pass, high pass, band stop, and uh, band pass filters. And uh, we saw the importance of uh, eliminating an uh, inductor, right? We saw how, you know, when impacting uh, the circuit, right? Yeah, and then uh, we also saw uh, the importance of uh, active filters. You know, when we need them, and uh, uh, we also saw for of very important, right? Because for, for first order, it's twenty dB, and then forty dB, and then sixty dB, uh, so on. Now, for your point of view, we'll be looking into one and second order, right? And, we will not be uh, in third order, right? For your uh, just the reference. Okay. These are the advantages and uh, the categories, right? And these are basics of the filters and uh, what constitutes them, right? And we have solved quite a few problems based on these filters. We also saw a silent key filter, right? Sometimes to confuse you, the examiner could ask, uh, you know, what is meant by the second order low pass active filter. So usually second order filters are called uh, silent key filter. Okay, either it can be low pass or uh, the high pass. The high pass is also called silent key, right? So do not get confused, right? Okay, so we had solved the problem till here, isn't it? Uh, we had got about 5.77 kilohertz, right? Okay, so today, uh, you know, we'll be into band pass filters and band pass filters. So as the name suggests, right, band pass is nothing but, it allows a certain band to be passed, right? So here you can see, initially it is cut off, and here also it's cut off, but only the middle portion is actually transferred, right? So you can imagine that this is a combination of both low pass and high pass filters. Okay, low pass and high pass filters. Now, um, uh, you know, do we need that kind of thing will be my next question. So I will say, uh, yes, we do need, because sometimes, you know, we need to just pass a section, right? And we need to block the other segments, right? So that happens only when we combine two or three things. And uh, usually you know, we don't get uh, performance with the single circuit. So we try to create a kind of hybrid uh, circuit, right? So this is a multi band pass filter that you can see here, okay? And uh, <clears throat> you can see that the combination of uh, the low pass and high pass filter, okay. So a band pass filter can be constructed simply by connecting low pass and high pass filter cascade uh, as we have seen here, right? So we can use that kind of, you know, scenario, okay? So it will, it will actually give us just a moment. So it will actually give us, you know, uh, the desired type of property that we need, which is, um, you know, the band of frequency which has been allocated. Now, let us say, for example, you know, now there is not just one cutoff. There's going to be two cutoff uh, frequencies. And those are called as F1 and F2, okay? So let us assume that one, okay, we have about 10 kilohertz and F2 is about 100 kilohertz, right? So two types of cutoff frequencies here, right? So this being the lower cutoff frequency and this being the higher cutoff frequency. Now, the low pass circuit will pass all the frequencies up to 100 kilohertz. So low pass will actually pass everything up to 100 uh, kilohertz and the high pass circuit, what it will do is, it will block all the frequencies below 
10 kilohertz. So we are kind of combining both low pass and high pass filter, and we are getting a combination. We get a desired region. Okay, so this in becomes a region of input. Okay, right. Let's uh, move on. Okay, now there's also a combination okay, where we can use a single uh, bandpass filter. And uh, the most important thing that you have to know here is in this kind of stage, right? You will have to know the formula, right? Uh, the gain formula which is R2 by Z1. So we see what it is. So the capacitors are selected to have T2 large enough to be neglected at low frequencies. Now we have always seen that, you know, the frequency and, uh, you know, the uh, reactive capacitance, they are. Are they directly proportional or indirectly proportional? How is it? The reactive, uh, the reactive capacitance and the um, you know frequencies are they directly or indirectly proportional? You can recall. Yeah, very good. They are indirectly proportional. So. Okay, so we'll be just looking into it. So since XC2 is large enough so to be neglected at low frequencies, so we cannot neglect this X because nothing but, you know, the capacitive uh, inductance, capacitive reactance, right? And uh, XC1 is small enough. So this, we have two capacitors here, C1 and C2. So that is what it's referring to. So C1 is made small, and it can be neglected at high frequencies. So you can see that, you know, at higher frequencies, um, you know, XC1 is small and at uh, lower frequencies, C2 is large. So you can see the uh, disproportionate uh, things between uh, XC and the frequencies. If one is high, the other is low. So they're indirectly proportional, right? Okay, now at low frequency, Okay, uh, we will see a few factors. Um, X2 is selected large, neglected at low frequencies. Right? So it's obvious at low frequency, I'm going to have X2 to be large. And then the uh, gain of it is going to be R2 by Z1. What is this Z1? We come to the figure here, okay, um, where I am putting. okay, I am combining uh, R1 and R1, okay, the reactive capacitance and I'm just terming it as Z1, right? So the feedback, as we all know, right? The feedback uh, is very much important here, right? So it becomes R2 divided by Z1. Now Z1 is a combination of R1 and XC1. So please note down the formula, right? This is important. So, you know, you could be asked, uh, problems with regards to this formula. So at signal frequencies in the path band of the circuit, C1 becomes very small. One. So when it's in the pass band, okay, when it's in the pass band region, okay, meaning to say when it's actually, you know, passing the information, passing the signal from one point to another, right, C1 becomes very small. R1, okay, then in that case, when XC1 is too small, right? so what we do, we take in AV as R2 by R1. So we don't consider this Z1, but then we just take R2 and R1. Now let us say, uh, you know, XC1 is equal to R1. So usually we try to make this case only when, uh, you know, in the cutoff region, okay? cutoff uh, frequency, let's see, right? So if one is equal to R1, then B reduces to three dB below from the mid-band frequency K. So XC1 will be equal, will be made equal to R1 at F1. Right? So at F1, we are trying to make the frequency, um, you know, the negative capacitance equal to R1. So the the first thing that you know you have to remember here is uh, you know with regards to the formula, right? 
and uh, what is this one talking to us about okay now at high frequencies what is it going to happen so all this that we learned here was at low frequency right so here now we are going to learn for high frequency what is it going to happen at high frequency now you can see the small change in the circuit like here you know you have r1 xe1 r2 r3 so come down here so i am trying to put that here right? so this c which was here okay is actually put here for high frequency right so together i am going to call this as v okay z fine so xc1 is uh, selected more enough than r1 c1 to be neglected at high frequency so whenever something is too large right we cannot neglect it okay so always keep this in mind if it's too small right so then we can neglect it if it is large then we tend to um, use it okay so keep this in mind so the circuit acts as an inverting amplifier and it has the gain av is equal to xc2 in parallel combination with r2 right so you can see here that uh, xc2 xc2 is in parallel combination with r2 and uh, of course we need r1 because this is at the input side so output by input so output is is wholly responsible with uh, uh, xc2 and parallel combination of r2 okay and uh, divided by r1 so this is going to be equal to right 1 by r1 uh, so this formula you will have to remember which is 1 by r2 square because here you have r2 connected right and uh, the xc2 is also connected so you are taking the square of them so at frequency in the pass band okay so what is it going to be it is going to be the same just like how we saw r2 by r1 the same thing is followed here right now when xc2 is made equal to r2 okay so usually at 3 db right so we try to make them as equal as possible and uh, so in pass band circuit right so we see that uh, it behaves as an inverting amplifier why does it behave because you know you're able to see the minus here right so inputs are given to the inverting terminal and a low pass filter for high frequencies and a high pass filter at low frequency so, so since it's a combination here right it's a combination of uh, low pass and high pass filter so you can imagine that at lower frequencies right uh, it is actually acting as a high pass filter and at uh, at uh, at higher frequencies is actually acting as a low pass filter right so i have tried and calibrated the nodes as much as possible right so that it becomes easy for you to understand um, if you if you just refer the textbook right so it's going to be a little complex for you to understand so i suggest that even for your examination point of view you could just refer my notes and uh, that should be sufficient for you because what i've done is you know i've i've given a theory about it the related formulas and how the design is done and problems so you know that should be sufficient even if you're thinking of uh, designing a filters for your uh, projects as well okay so what are the design steps here we're going to have uh, c2 which is much larger than the stray capacitance so we take c2 usually you know we have seen that you know we take it about a uh, uh, 1000 picofarad so we are following the same thing here right and uh, we take r2 okay we calculate r2 uh, uh, with the help of xc2 right so we have this uh, usual formula f is equal to 1 by 2 pi uh, c2 xc2 right so yeah so r1 okay r1 is found using the usual gain formula right voltage gain which is r2 by r1 the one that we saw here remember r2 by r1 and even we saw here r2 by uh, r1 here so the same formula is just summarized here and c1 is actually used with the help of f1 so i will i will try to cross multiply them i will bring f down and take c to the other side so based on what is asked in the question okay if frequency is asked or if uh, the capacitance is asked anything so we will be using this common formula 
and we are going to select R3 is equal to R2. So keep this um, circuit in mind whenever you are doing your explanation, right? So now let's see a problem. Uh, design a single stage bandpass filter to have unity voltage gain. Uh, now students, can you tell me what is this unity voltage gain? Have we seen this before? What is this unity voltage gain? Have we come across it? Yes. Okay. So this is actually referring to, you know, um, voltages and uh, output voltages and input voltages being one. One means uh, being equal, right? So when the numerator and denominator comes in, it becomes unit. Fine. So we need to uh, design a filter, okay, where the range is from 300 hertz to 30 kilohertz. So the lower frequency will actually be F1 and the higher uh, frequency is going to be F2. So two types of frequencies. So F1, I will take it as 300 and F2 as 30 kilohertz. So I'm going to take C2 as um, 1000 picofarads, right? And uh, I'm going to substitute the values here, 1 divided by 2 pi Fc. So 2 pi F, um, you know, I'm going to use the highest frequency here, F2 and C2, right? So we have already considered C2 to be 1000. So that comes out to be about 5.3 kilo ohms. So we don't have that value. So we will take 5.6 as the standard. Okay. Right. Now for AV is equal to one, why are we taking this? Because it's a unity gain. So AV is equal to one and R1, R2, we are taking the same value. Remember not the calculated value, but we're going to take the practical value that I'm going to use. Okay. So XC1 is equal to R1 at F1. Remember we are trying to equate this with the, uh, you know, cutoff uh, frequency, All right? So so as I mentioned previously, F and C, I try to swap them around. So C1 is equal to one by two pi F1 R1. So two pi, uh, my frequency, okay, here is going to be 300, right? I'm going to use the F1 here and here I've used F2, two pi uh, R1. So that is going to give me approximately about 0.1 microfarad. So uh, 0 0.005 microfarad is increased here, right? So that actually doesn't make any um, problem. So that's fine. So we are going to take R3 and R2, the equal value, so which is 5.6. So in this way, you know, if we can find out R2, C1 and R3, so that gives us the design here, right? So you can add, at the end of your problem, once you finish solving your problem, right, you have to draw the circuit and you can mention these values here. For example, R2 is 5.3. So you put that value here, 5.3, right? So that actually completes your problem uh, in a proper way, okay? Right. Now, talking about the bandwidth, right? So if you can see, uh, you know, with respect to bandwidth, uh, there is wide band and there is narrow band, right? So wide band, as you can see the waveform, right? It has huge range of frequencies, right? It can accommodate huge range of frequencies. But then with narrow band, you can see that, you know, it's just starting and then uh, it's going to the peak, right? And then it's coming down. So hence, you know, narrow band has less frequencies accommodated, you can see the difference between F1 and F2, right? It's very less, but then here between F1 and F2, it's very large. Okay, so wideband and narrowband filters are shown and in both cases, as we all know, bandwidth is equal to F2 minus F1, isn't it? The higher frequency minus the lower frequency. So that gives my uh, total bandwidth and that allows me to calculate you know, what is going to be my uh, range of frequencies. Now there is something called Q factor, right? The best operating point, the Q factor is the figure of merit for a filter circuit. So 
Q factor is nothing but a figure of merit, and this is for the filter circuit. So it defines the selectivity of the filter in passing uh, center frequency F0 and rejecting other frequencies. So Q factor, uh, if we have to uh, put it in the formula, so it is uh, F0 divided by BW. So BW is your bandwidth. F0 is nothing but your center frequency. See the one that you can see here, the center frequency, because I have F1, I have F2, okay? And you can see here, for Q is equal to 10, and for Q is equal to one. So when Q is equal to 10, right, I have very narrow bandwidth, right? And for Q is equal to one, my bandwidth is actually uh, a little increased one. Okay, so in diagram B, so in this diagram, we can see that with Q is 10, okay, it is very narrow, right? And compared to Q is equal to one. So this is having a quality factor, a Q, factor of one okay so which is very wide and this one is narrow which means we have given the q uh, to be higher value. so as q increases the range of frequencies accommodated is also reduced so even this is inversely proportional q and the bandwidth okay so you can see that here q and bandwidth so q is here and bandwidth is at the denominator so obviously they are inversely proportional so narrow uh, bandwidth uh, filters have Q greater than five and wide band filters have Q less than five. So keep this in mind, narrow band filters, okay, will have uh, huge values of Q and uh, wide band will have less values of Q. Now the center frequency F2 and uh, the center frequency F0 is taken with the help of F2 and F1. Now we're taking the square root of them, okay? Right, so now let's uh, look at an example, okay? And uh, we will try and um, utilize all these formulas that we have seen here, and uh, we'll try and design them, okay? So calculate the Q factor for a wide bandwidth filter, which was designed, uh, you know, we had used this previously in our designs. So we will use this and uh, the same circuit, right? So we have the F0, okay, which is nothing but the center frequency is F2, F1. So we have, um, you know, we are taking the same values here, 300 Hertz and 30 kilohertz, right? So we should be getting about three kilohertz. Now the bandwidth as we know is F2 minus F1, which is nothing but 30 kilo minus 300. So that gives me about 29.7 uh, kilohertz. See, if you can see here, the formulas are all very simple, right? The only thing that you have to do is, you know, just remember them properly. See, uh, calculating F0 shouldn't be a problem. You know, calculating uh, bandwidth shouldn't be a problem because it's just F2 minus F1. And this, there is stepwise marking as well, right? So, so for whatever uh, steps that you, or whatever, you know, so for, for whatever uh, calculations that you are doing, you will be marked up accordingly, right? Now we, we know that uh, Q is nothing but uh, F0 divided by PW. So we have F0's value, I bring it down. I have PW's value, which is bandwidth. So I am getting about uh, 0.1. Can someone confirm if this 0.1 is fine? Please calculate and tell me, take out your calculators and tell me if we are getting about 0.1 for that. So the kilo gets canceled, right? And Yes, sir, getting. Okay, that's good then. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's fine. So we will see another problem here, right? Uh, a single bandpass filter has uh, the following components. So here now again, 
they have given us different components, right? A uh, few components and based on that, we need to calculate. So R1, R2, they're giving us seven and a half kilo ohms and R3 is given. So, so I don't have to calculate here, um, you know, the values of resistance and capacitance. I already have them ready with me. C1 is there, C2 is there, R1, R2. See, the most important thing here are resistors and capacitors. So R1, R2, C1, C2 and R3, right? So determine the circuit bandwidth, center frequency and Q factor. So which means you're going to use the same formula, F0, BW and Q, right? So, so I will be using uh, F1, okay? Now they have not told us what is F1 and they have not told us what is F2. So I need to use this formula 1 divided by 2 pi uh, C1 R1, right? So I substitute them, I bring uh, it, 8,200 picofarads here, and then R1 is given as seven and a half, right? So I should be getting about 2.58 uh, kilohertz, and then F2 as 28.29. Uh, so once I have these F1 and F2, the um, rest of the thing is like a piece of the cake, right? Because F2 minus F1 and F0 is uh, F2, F1. So all are dependent on uh, frequency two and frequency one. So center frequency can be easily done, bandwidth can be easily done, and the quality factor is of course dependent on F0 and PW. So, so I'm getting, when I minus them, I'm getting about 27, uh, 25.7, and uh, F0 is about eight and a half, and the bandwidth uh, is about 0.33. Uh, can someone confirm if this is fine? 8.5K divided by 2, 25.7K, K gets canceled per kilo. So it's just 8.5 uh, divided by 25.7. Is it fine? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, yeah. So the next one is notch filter. Sometimes, you know, uh, you might get confused. What is this notch? I have heard of band stop. I have heard of band... Uh, you know, uh, band pass, but what is this notch filter, right? So you might get confused. So it is nothing but the same thing, right? Band stop is also called as notch filters, right? So don't get confused. There are multiple names for it, okay? So uh, it can also be called as notched filter. It can be called as band limiter, or it can be called as uh, band stop. So anything asked examination point of view, do not get confused. So it is actually referring to the same thing. Okay, fine. So <clears throat> a notched filter, okay, or we can also call it as a, a band stop filter, right? So this is nothing but the same as I was mentioning, right? Which is band limit or band stop. So notch filter is the inverse. So you can see First, what was happening in our previous um, um, you know, band pass, it was actually you know, coming like this, and then it was going here and then coming down, right? Like, let me, let me just uh, write it up. Okay, so it was like this, and then it came down, isn't it? But now the reverse is happening. So you can see that you know it is uh, increasing and decreasing, but then here, okay? But then here, what is happening? The reverse is happening, which is, which means, you know, I am uh, seeing an increased waveform first, right? I'm seeing an increased waveform first. Uh, here it's going from low to high. Now here it's going from high to low, right? So it's in that fashion. So it's the reverse of what we saw previously. Okay. Now see this uh, diagram here. We have used high pass and low pass filter. Along with that, we have used a summing circuit, right? So that's important here. So previously we had not done this, but now we are using a summing filter, okay? So uh, those range of frequencies that I've mentioned there is just for our reference, okay? You don't have to uh, you know, actually mention that, uh, but then I have just kept it for explanation point of view, which is you now telling you that, you know, this can be probably 10, 100 kilohertz and this can be 10 kilohertz. Okay, I just wanted to differentiate that, you know, it is uh, high frequency and low frequency. Fine. So once you have a combination of them and then a summing circuit, that gives you your notch filter. Okay. 
Okay, and here both the circuits are connected in parallel, unlike previously, right? So uh, if you can compare the previous one, right? We were not using that fashion, right? How was it connected previously? It was connected serially, isn't it? Low pass and high pass are connected serially. But then here I am seeing that it is being connected in parallel combination for uh, band stop or notch filter. So there's another method of actually creating uh, these notch filters, right? So they are nothing but, you know, uh, the sum of output of bandpass filter with its own input signal. So we can give the same summing circuit here as usual, the same thing is used, but then uh, I'll be using a bandpass filter here, which means it already has a combination of low pass and high pass in series. And I'm going to take part of the output, okay? And the input, and I'm giving to the summing circuit. So this is another way of creating a notch filter, right? So in this case, the bandpass filter should have gain equal to one and it should be inverting. So these are the two conditions if you want to follow the second case. Okay, so for your um, explanation point of view, you can mention the first one. You can put this graph here, okay? And you can mention, uh, you know, as to the alternative way of designing. So it has low pass band and then stop band and then high pass. So it's going to be, you know, this middle section is going to be stopped and lower regions are allowed and higher regions of frequencies are allowed. So here also we will have two frequencies, okay, above which it's going to, uh, you know, attenuate and uh, uh, above F2, it's actually going to allow all the signal frequencies. So during pass band of a band pass circuit filter output, okay, so this one is called as VBP, which is band pass voltage, which is equal to minus VI because it is in what configuration? In inverting configuration, right? So you can find that the two inputs of uh, summing circuit cancel out and it gives a zero output voltage. So output is also there, okay, input is also there, summing circuit, what it happens? And it is uh, trying to uh, cancel out each other because this is an inverting output, right? This is a non-inverting output. So it's canceling out and my output is going to be stopped, right? So we can also term it as stop band filter. So pass band of the circuit, which is VBP is negligible. Therefore, the output of summing circuit is VI and the combination of both. Right? Uh, the combination of this band pass uh, filter, okay, is actually going to be nullified because I'm taking plus and minus, right? So, you know, it's going to be the reverse here from the input and output, and the same thing is given. So it is going to function as a notch filter. Now, this is a single stage notch filter, okay? Uh, we are using, an extra resistor here, right? Previously, we didn't have this. So we are using an extra resistor here. So R4 is used extra. Now, if you can compare, right? Your band pass, yeah. Right, we had just R1, R2, R3, C1, C2. But R4 is coming here in parallel with R1. So R1 is there, C1, C2, okay? And R4 is here. So, you know, this is a slight modification that we have done uh, in order to uh, come out with single stage notch filter. So here the bandpass filter can be converted to a single stage notch by adding the resistor R4. Now there's a small condition here. R4 is equal to, if in case R4 is equal to R1, if this R4 and R1 both are made equal and we have R3 and R2 both made equal, then the circuit will function like a difference amplifier, right? So remember in our difference amplifier, we had taken all the resistors to be the same, right? So if that combination is done here, this circuit will get converted to a difference amplifier, wherein the differences between the inputs are uh, sensed and then it is amplified and given at the output, okay? So it produces an inverted, um, VI because it's connected to minus terminal here. 
okay the other side um, you know produce vi in all range of frequencies fine that is okay now the output of difference amplifier is going to be r2 by r1 into vi minus vf why is this vf here because you know we are considering the feedback as well as r2 is equal to r1 okay so v0 is equal to vi minus vf okay now vf is nothing but the pass band filter the output of this pass band filter now in pass band of notch filter the band pass will stop uh, will be in stop band therefore v0 is equal to vi minus 0 so in the stop band okay v0 is equal to vi minus 0 there's nothing to cancel out so vi is going to be uh, you know the input is going to be equal to the output now in stop band of notch filter the band pass will be in pass band therefore it fully cancels out each other so input minus input so i'm going to get zero so this is how you know i actually design uh, uh, the filter and i'm able to get this right so to attain this zero value it takes some time from high value to low it takes some time so it slowly comes down uh, and then becomes low and then slightly increases as the frequency uh, is given higher now there are some design factors for this right so as usual c2 is taken large okay uh, f2's formula is remaining the same and my gain okay my voltage gain is also the same r2 by r1 okay and uh, since it's a unity gain if i take this uh, r2 r1 same so it's going to be a unity gain then uh, c1 and f1 of course is going to be the same same formula here as in the uh, design step two and i'm going to use this r3 is equal to r2 and r4 is equal to r1 so which means it functions it functions as a uh, uh, difference amplifier right okay so these are the you know design steps that you will have to remember okay and uh, uh, the problem okay so we will just look into a problem here a single stage notch filter is to be designed to have a stop band which is ranging from 200 hertz to 20 kilohertz so f1 becomes this and f2 becomes 20 kilohertz determine the suitable component values so what i will do f1 i take and then f2 i take then i'm going to assume c2 is 1000 picofarads right and r2's uh, formula we have 1 by 2 pi and f is what 20 kilohertz i'm going to take this 20 kilohertz here and then c's value so i should be getting about uh, 7.96 um, and uh, r1 r2 we are taking it to be equal which is about uh, uh, 8.2 because i'm using the practical value here right then r3 is equal to r r2 is equal to r4 so all the resistors i'm going to make them equal right so i'm going to use them in uh, differential amplifier mode and uh, c1 now i'm going to use the lower frequency which is 200 hertz okay so 2 pi 200 and r1 which is 8.2 kilo so i should be getting about uh, 0 0.097 micro farads okay so with this you know we actually complete the portion with respect to filters okay with respect to filters um, next we have um, three or four more topics right so those are nothing but uh, uh, voltage regulators okay and then triple five timers phase lock loop uh, DAC and adc so these are the four topics left out and uh, we will be uh, looking to it in our uh, next sessions okay and uh, i will be starting off with voltage regulators first okay it's a very pretty simple concept and triple five timers of course you all have seen them and uh, face lock loop yes very interesting DAC and adc right uh, the conversion that happens between digital and uh, analog so this is going to be the second half of your uh, fourth module okay uh, in fact uh, i can say 
that uh, you know filters occupy about uh, 60 percent 60 65 percent of your fourth module right so we are done with the filters and right now we'll be looking into voltage regulators very simple topic and uh, <clears throat> yeah we will just look about uh, the variations in voltage regulators and uh, yeah many other things now before we get started uh, can someone give me an example of a regulator have you seen regulators in your day-to-day -day lives so we've seen yeah can you give me an example regulators used to control the fan speed very good right and now uh, yeah all electrical appliances will have very good mixes etc very good so all these have regulators in them so not only you know these kind of uh, appliances but then we also need regulators for you know our electronic devices for our electronic circuits so we have designed these regulators wherein it can have control over you know how much potential that can pass through and how much can be rejected so this is a brief context as to what I'll, i'm going to present right um, it's going to be about uh, the introduction and uh, um, regulators using opam then ic voltage regulators regulators brought out in the form of ic integrated circuit see i'll tell you one thing students this ic is once it came up right um, the field of electronics changed in a drastic way right so we had to connect various circuits you know a lot of um, you know, misconnections would happen, a lot of patch cords needed, all those things. So once this IC came into picture, right, it blew away the industry, right? And once OPAM came in, right, that was, uh, you know, like uh, cherry on the cake, right? So things started changing once these technologies came into the market and, uh, you know, they started, uh, I can say, uh, devastating, uh, you know, in a positive way. So any application, okay, any uh, content that you see, okay, um, any circuit that you see, okay, always involved regulators and ICs. And also we'll be looking at a seven to three series of uh, regulators and switching regulators, right? So the function of a voltage regulator is to provide constant stable DC voltage for powering other electronic circuits. So you have seen this in our day-to-day -day lives, right? We have seen, um, example can be the voltage stabilizers, right? Which we, uh, which we add uh, along with our televisions. Of course, our televisions come, come with a small circuitry, which can stabilize the uh, spikes in uh, input voltages, but then we try to uh, give an extra support, okay? We try to have an extra layer of security by having, um, you know, a regulator or a stabilizer. So these regulators are classified into two types. One is going to be um, series or linear, and the other one is going to be switching regulator. So switching regulator, I'll be looking into this um, in probably the end section, right? Uh, in the last portion, right? So this is going to be a simple circuit, right? Um, input is uh, V in. Uh, I have a small control circuitry here. Whenever there is a regulator, students keep in mind there will always be a variable resistance, right? So even the regulators that you see, it has a resistance in them where you are able to increase or decrease the resistance, right? So it can either, uh, you know, uh, increase the resistance or it can decrease the resistance. So this control circuit that you are seeing here is in the mid section, right? So input is here. I have my control circuit, right? So I can call this whole thing as a regulator and whatever comes at the output right is going to be constant so i'm going to use these regulated outputs so we use this term right unregulated and regulated so regulated terms are used after rectification right after rectification so uh, you know they use power transistor connected in series between the unregulated DC input and the load. So these are power transistors, right? Which uh, handles the control circuit. Okay, so going uh, with the next one, 
the same figure I have brought in, right? And the output voltage is controlled by continuous voltage drop uh, taking place across the series pass transistor. So, so this voltage drop that is happening, okay, is controlled by a pass transistor, okay? So transistor works in the active or linear region. These regulators are also called linear regulators. The reason why they are called linear regulators is because they work in the linear region. Now, remember in your transistor, uh, you know, you had cut off linear and saturation. So linear was the region where, you know, you could find the waveform actually increasing drastically, right, with respect to the input. So that is called the linear region. So here these regulators or these transistors are working in the linear region and hence the term linear regulators. Now, if a question is asked regarding advantages and disadvantages, right? You can you can uh, jot them, you can put them down, and uh, you can just mention as it's a simple circuit configuration, very few external parts, and low noise. When I say low noise, it means that we are not going to have any kind of uh, disturbances, right? So the circuit is going to be good. Fine. Uh, what are the disadvantages? It has poor efficiency, considerable heat generation, only step down operation. So we do not have any step up operation. Remember, uh, you know, in transformers, we have this concept of step up transformer and uh, step down transformers, right? So in these regulators, we don't have anything as such, right? We have a concept called step down. So in step down, uh, we are looking at reducing the uh, potential differences uh, whereby these electronic devices can have uh, less potentials given to them, right? So, of course, I cannot treat that as a disadvantage, but but then I know I can probably tell it as a, a kind of a property, okay, that is uh, actually with these uh, low-powered devices, right? So, we have an input. So, this is very unregulated or I can say raw input. And then, uh, you know, I have the control element here, which is sitting in between uh, consisting of transistors and variable resistance that you can see here. And my output is going to be as smooth as possible, which is going to be as good as a DC line. Okay. Now, uh, you can, you know, towards the right-hand side, I've just put up some waveforms, right? Where you can see um, there's a switching operation happening, the pulses. Now, can you all recall the DC motor and stepper motor experiments that you have been doing, uh, you know, with regards to uh, HDL labs? Right, so that is also based on this pulse width uh, of pulse width operation. Okay, or in other terms, we can also term it as pulse width modulation. So as the on and off periods change, okay. So you know, as the on period is changed and the off period. So for example, here the off period is higher compared to the on. So if I can increase the on and reduce the off, right? So that's when I am actually giving more potential. So if more potential is given, it means the speed is increased with regards to a motor, okay? Or with regards to a bulb, then yeah, you know, the, the intensity, the light intensity increases. You know, these days you have these programmable bulbs. Have you all seen them, right? Where you can increase and decrease the brightness, you can change the level of colors, right? Um, have you seen all of these students? Yes, no. no. Yes, sir. Yeah. So all that is possible only because of these pulse width modulation. So I'm able to give a higher pulse and a lower pulse, um, you know, because of which the potentials are increased or decreased and accordingly the intensity or the, uh, you know, luminescence, okay, that is going to vary. So a switching regulator is a voltage regulator that uses a switching element to transform the incoming uh, power supply into a pulsed voltage. So, so, you know, this is going to be the input voltage, right? And my output voltage, as you can see, is a stable line here, right? It's a very stable line. And this is my switching element. Hand switching element uh, involves transistors. Now, these transistors, they're working in linear region, so they are called linear regulators okay so power supply from the input to the output um, is uh, happening with the help of mosfet now students remember two things mosfet can function as amplifier 
and it can function as a switch. So here we are exploring the option of switching uh, with regards to MOSFET. Okay, so <clears throat> until the desired voltage is reached, once the output voltage reaches the predetermined value, the switch element is turned off and no input power is consumed. So whenever the switch is off, right? So we can assume that, you know, it's not going to allow any power. So which means it's going to take care of the potential differences. Repeating this operation at high speeds makes it possible to supply a voltage efficiently with less heat and generation. So by this, what is happening if I can use a switching element? See, because I'm turning off uh, for a certain amount of time, which means I'm giving some time for the circuit to actually cool down, isn't it? So, so with this, what is happening? Uh, you know, we can actually increase its efficiency, right? So at the end, we can see that it gives improved efficiency uh, over series regulator as compared to the previous one, right? Um, here, okay. Yeah, just compare these two. Uh, you find that you have just the input voltage, right? Control element and the load. So this is just a series regulator. But then when we use, you know, a switching operation here, that's when things start changing, right? So this becomes more efficient. So the next thing that we'll see is the advantage and disadvantages of using the switching regulators. So questions can be asked, right, with regards to um, the usual series regulators or switching regulators. So keep in mind when we use switching, it means that we are using a MOSFET and that is uh, used in the form of a switch. So the advantages, uh, high efficiency, low heat, okay? So uh, I can boost or, you know, I can probably reduce the potentials um, to whichever levels needed, okay? So this was not possible with our normal uh, regulator, which is series regulators. But then with the help of transistor, I'm able to shoot up the values. More external parts required, fine. Um, you know, that's because we are including an extra section here, isn't it? We are including an extra section here. So um, as I always mentioned, if the advantages are more compared to disadvantages, right, we just go for it. Uh, it's a complicated design compared to the previous one. And uh, this is slight increased noise. Of course, with the help of filters, you know, we can nullify that voice, um, you know, noise. And we can make sure that, you know, that those frequencies are only allowed, right? Now, with regards to uh, the series um, OPAM regulator, okay? So, so if a question is asked, then you can probably draw this diagram. You have an unregulated power supply, DC power supply. Okay, and then you have an op-amp here, and then this is a zener diode. Okay, and the reason why we're using the zener diode is because, uh, you know, we are going to exploit or explore its uh, uh, reverse breakdown functionality, right? Then I'm using a series uh, transistor here, okay? And uh, resistors R1, R2, and the load RL, right? So a voltage regulator is an electronic circuit that um, provides a stable DC voltage independent of load, temperature, or AC line. So no matter whatever changes that we are doing at this input side, my outputs should be as constant as possible, even though there is a load or there is no load, right? You would have heard of um, uh, short circuit and open circuit, right? So that is with respect to loads. So even though I have it or not, right? I should be able to get a proper output, right? So that is the functionality of a regulator. Now, what are the major components that we can see in the circuit? So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> you can see a Zener diode, right? So why we are using this? We are using this as a reference. Then we have a difference amplifier, right? So a difference amplifier, uh, which means an op-amp here. So the differences are, are checked, okay? And those differences are actually uh, modified and it is given as an output, right? Okay. Now, uh, the series pass transistor, okay, which is Q1. 
So we are finding a transistor here. And then we have a feedback network, which is R1 and R2. R1, R2 is working as a feedback network. Why is it working as a feedback network? Because the output here via the transistor is connected. And then it is coming through the Zener diode and getting connected to the non-inverting terminal. So, so which means, you know, we are, we are kind of having a feedback network here. Okay. And that is with the help of R1 and R2. And of course, here we have the load resistance, which is RL, and the currents across them are called IL. Right? Okay. Now, if the operation is asked, right? So this is going to be your answer. The transistor Q1 is connected as an emitter follower, right? So which means um, it is dependent on the emitter of the transistor, okay? And therefore provide sufficient current gain to drive the load so transistor q1 is taken for driving the currents the output voltage is sampled by potential uh, dividers okay which is nothing but r1 and r2 so those are nothing but the feedback network as i've mentioned before and uh, feedback to the inverting input terminal of the op-amp error amplifier okay if the output voltage increases, um, so due to variations, okay, in the load, then the sampled beta V naught also increases. Now, where is this sample beta V naught? We have it here, right? We have it here. So this sample, we we always kind of take a sample here from the negative terminal, right? With respect to ground, so this is beta means gain, okay, gain into V naught. So this is my total output. Okay, uh, that uh, you know I'm going to consider uh, with respect to uh, the op-amp. Okay, so because whatever you're getting here at the positive um, uh, invert non-inverting terminal, the same thing you would receive here at the uh, inverting terminal, right? So beta into V helps me to do that. Uh, this in turn reduces the output voltage of the difference amplifier uh, due to 180 degree phase shift. Okay, so there's going to be a 180 degree phase shift and this is provided by the op-amp amplifier. So why, why is there 180 degree? Students, can you tell me? Because we are treating it from or we are checking it from minus terminal, right? Inputs are given here to the positive terminal. So obviously there's going to be a 180 degree phase shift. Now there are two categories in regulators, right? So number one, um, it is uh, seven, eight series and 7-9 series of um, uh, voltage series regulators. And the other one, which I was telling you is general purpose 723. So for your syllabus point of view, we are learning these uh, two types of uh, voltage regulators. Now the main difference here, okay? So when I say 78XX, it means that, you know, there is some series involved here, okay? So we will understand what this is referring to. 78XX series are three terminal positive voltage regulators. So these are positive fixed voltage regulators, keep in mind. And the last numbers XX, which actually indicate the output voltage. For example, now if I have 0, 05, then it is actually mentioning that, you know, it's indicating that five volts is going to be my output. If it is 7808, then it's going to be eight volts, right? So this is how, you know, we try and understand any IC, you know, they will have a code for that. So you have to decode it and, uh, you know, you have to understand what, you know, these numbers are actually specifying. Now, what about the 79 series? So these are three terminal, just like the 78 series, but these are negative fixed voltage regulators, right? 78 is positive, 79 is negative. Any doubt students up till this point? No, sir. Okay. So 78 positive, 79 negative. Last two numbers is referring to the output potentials that they are actually uh, able to give us. Right. Now, this is a small uh, standard representation that we have, you know, for the 78 series, uh, where I'm using a, uh, input capacitor, okay, which is about 0.33 microfarad, and this is ceramic. Now remember, you have two types, the ceramic and uh, you know the paper type. So 
ceramic is uh, you know uh, the most used type of capacitor fine so mc788xxc right so input is given here to the first terminal in the second terminal i get the output ground is connected to the third terminal and this is my unregulated input and once i get out okay the output potentials are going to be regulated and at the output side i'm going to use a, a capacitor which is c naught okay the output capacitor fine so this is a standard representation of uh, you know a uh, regulator so capacitors are connected in between input terminal and ground to cancel the inductive effect now um, you know what is this inductive effect the inductive reactance right remember we were learning about it in filters right so if we have to cancel it you know it uh, it actually helps out in better operation of the circuit and uh, long distribution lets so since we have you know huge wires here okay connecting wires so this capacitors will actually nullify them so output capacitance improves the transient response so transient response is input across output so if i have this capacitor right so it will help in charging and discharging so if that thing happens uh, then there's no way that you know i will be losing the uh, signals right okay so capacitors you know they actually play a very important role uh, in uh, in getting uh, these uh you know uh, signals not losing out okay Fine. uh we will just look into the characteristics and the limitations right performance we will look into in the next class so characteristics um as i mentioned uh, the regulated output voltage 78 series has 5 6 8 so it can be 7805 7806 7808 and unregulated uh, input voltage which is v in okay v in is going to be greater than or equal to you know output voltage plus 2 volts remember i'm taking a, a mod here which means respective of um, positive or negative voltages so if v not is equal to 5 then you know my v in has to be 7 i've just given an example here right uh, so v not plus 2 volts that is to be the condition for your input so input should be higher then the output load uh, output current okay which is i not max it can vary from zero to maximum uh, based on you know how much of potentials that you are actually giving the thermal shutdown has sensors which turns off the ic when it becomes too hot uh, like 125 to 150 degrees celsius see usually what happens uh, whenever there is a variation in temperature right um when compared to your laptops right the fans kick in so fans are usually used to you know vent out the hot air but uh, you know in cases of ic also this can happen when the temperatures increase so if the temperatures have increased the sensors should be calibrated in such a way that if i am reaching this point then i am nullifying it okay i am trying to you know shut down it so that is nothing but called a thermal shutdown very important concept right uh, which actually saves devices usually you know uh, i remember ic's previously where they didn't have this kind of uh, functionality right and uh, uh, the disadvantage was that you know those ic's were burning out because of excessive heat right so that is actually controlled here with the help of thermal shutdown okay so what are the limitations um no short circuit operation and output voltage is going to be fixed so whatever is my output voltage so that is going to be fixed and uh, no short circuit uh, protection so that is you know one thing uh, short circuit is something where i think you would have seen in the fuses right uh, in the mcb switches wherein a small metallic wire will be connecting the positive and the negative terminal have you seen that students yes a fuse a fuse yeah. wire yeah yes yeah so which is you know actually like a small hair line you know hair line structure so so this circuit doesn't have short circuit protection and the output voltage is fixed so that's fine okay uh, but then it has a, a thermal control 
right? So this is the property of MC78XXC series, right? So students, I think we will end here and uh, we'll probably continue in our upcoming session uh, with regards to the performance and we will see, you know, um, how it can be used as a current source boosters and, you know, few quite a few important formulas, um, you know, pertaining to voltage regulators.